early to 9 a.m. I know it's not the easiest. I appreciate it. Um, so yeah, first I want to ask a question for you guys. Who in this room considers themselves a developer? Okay, it's like half the room. It's just helpful to know, um, you know, as we go through everything. Um, another question for everyone, who has ever had anything ever break on their website? <laughs> okay, everyone, everyone. Okay, not surprising. Now let's go a little more specific. Who's ever had a contact form or a checkout break? Okay, still good amount. All right, perfect. And who is now either terrified or tests their checkout and form all the time manually? <laughs> no one, okay. That's what I expected. Don't blame you. I don't think I do either, right? So that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit today is how can we do certain testing called Indian testing to, sorry guys. I thought it wouldn't. Michael, can you grab my power cable? Thank you. Um, Indian testing to essentially, um, to essentially go through, test your contact forms, test your uh, checkout, and do this in a way you don't have to manually do it, uh, and you don't have to worry, and you can sleep at night, right? So that's the goal. Um, but before we get into that, a little bit about myself. My name is Matt. Uh, I run a agency here in Atlanta. Um, and we're a web dev WordPress agency. Uh, and the only reason that's at all relevant is probably like a lot of you, we have a lot of client sites. Um, they can have different configurations. We sometimes inherit those sites. You learn the good and the bad of all those different sites. Um, and over the years, something that has come up kind of time and time again is, you know, how do you handle websites in a way um, to prevent them from breaking? And then if they break, how do you know if they break? ideally without your customer telling you or calling you, yes. Um, so uh, that came all into kind of fruition as an agency because we started looking into how can we test um, our contact forms, our checkout, really anything from the perspective of a user um, experience or user story uh, through the whole process. And so um, we started kind of building our own um, called CheckView. Um, I'm not even gonna talk about that one today, but uh, really today's talk is to just tell you guys what I've learned. I'm not gonna pretend I'm a QA engineer. If you are a QA engineer, I'm so sorry you're here. Um, you'll either be telling me I'm wrong, um, which is very, uh, you know, could be true, or you're gonna be bored out of your mind. Um, this is really meant for, you know, either developers who hate dealing with QA um, or agency owners, you know, managers of websites uh, that you want to start to learn a little bit about just how you can test your site and make sure it's performing. All right, sound good? Cool. Um, let's go not to that one. I'm learning this remote, I believe. Looks like, all right, so starting with just a little list of, you know, what can break on your website, um, what can cause it to break, that sort of thing. I don't think any of this is probably surprising to anyone of all the different things that can break your website. You know, obviously any sort of theme, plugin, uh, anything with your host, you might say, I never wanna update my site ever again. It's gonna run perfectly, but as you probably know, your host will have PHP updates, et cetera, MySQL date updates, that sort of thing, um, and you'll have to essentially deal with that eventually. Um, now on top of that, you can have just more updates from you know, your developers or content managers can break things, changing settings, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of you know, things that can break on your website um, and this is just you know, kind of a short list. Um, and that's not, I think, a bad thing from WordPress's perspective. Um, for example, we use a lot of third-party code not everyone does, but a lot of people do. Either you're extending WordPress you know, with your own code or you might be using third-party code, which could be a commercial plugin or you, you know, pay a developer. And that's the beauty of WordPress is you can extend it and we have a huge community. But the other side of it is that we're using a lot of third-party code, uh, which means it couldn't really all be tested. There's only so far the developers can, can test that code. They can't test every single plugin combination that you're necessarily going to use on your website. Um, and so 
that's why things like this can happen, unintentional breaks and that sort of thing. And you might be saying, okay, well, I do a ton of stuff to actually make sure we know if the site's breaking. And this is just like a short little list, like, you know, how many people in here do uptime monitoring of their websites? So, you know, most people. And uh, how many people um, do any sort of visual regression testing? Has anyone heard of that? Visual regression? It's just basically where you take a screenshot and you compare, you know, has the site changed? And that sometimes just shows if something breaks. You might be doing, you know, things like that, um, page speed, security scans. Um, you might even be using reporting tools to tell you if your SMTP for email is down, that sort of thing, if you're going really fancy. Um, but one thing that's often not brought up is what we're going to get into, which is really testing kind of the whole shebang of, you know, what is that whole process? Because this leaves gaps in, you know, what is actually the fundamental reason for most websites, which comes down to some sort of, you know, contact form or a checkout. It might be a, a learning management system login or a course, something like that. So essentially, that's why, you know, there's other things that you typically want to look into. Um, so I've got like one pretty typical fire scenario, you could say, uh, and this is just a good example. <laughs> this is a good example, um, but you know, obviously it can vary. So one I've got here at 8 a.m. is a little hard to read, but at 8 a.m., you know, developers may make updates to live. They might have even done some testing, um, but you know, they maybe didn't test through the whole process. They just said, "Hey, the site's up. It looks good." Uh, seems reasonable, right? Um, so then around 8.30, customers start reporting that they have checkout errors. And of course, you know, it goes through customer service and customer service like, I don't know, I can't get screenshots from these people. They aren't technical, you know. So then the developers are struggling, you know, they're trying to figure out what to do. It gets passed to them. Maybe around 9.30, they actually figure out this is what maybe is going on. You know, we're shooting in the dark. But, you know, this is probably a good start. So then 10, they might patch it, you know, on staging. And then by 11, which I think this is a pretty reasonable timeline, they actually get it live. And that's if they're working that day, uh, the right people. So you can see you've got a pretty big gap here. And this is where when we talk about end-to-end -end testing, a lot of this could have actually been prevented. And even later in the process, if it's not prevented, a lot of times the developers can replicate the issue quicker because they could actually run a test based on what the customer feedback is. Um, so that's, that's kind of what um, the benefit is. And this is a good example of, you know, you might say, well, that's a lot of money. And obviously, it's going to depend on your website size and your risk. What are you willing to risk? You know, if you're not making, web, making any money on a website relatively, or it's just not a very important website, in your opinion, you may not be willing to do end-to-end -end testing. But this is a good example. Let's say you get 10, out, 10 orders per hour. Average order value is $122.82. You multiply that just based on that very simple example that we kind of gave. You can kind of, and, and you have to obviously do that based on the 10 orders. That gives you a good idea of what it's costing you. And that's obviously doesn't include your reputation just as a website or your reputation with a client plus the developer time scrambling, customer service, all that sort of thing. So in this way, you can probably justify some amount of additional testing. And that's what we're going to talk about even further is, you know, what's a reasonable way we could go about this that's not going to cost $50,000 to do, right? Um, so, you know, that's just, an, again, an example of how you could be burning money if you've ever experienced a site going down and I mean, I'll tell you personally, I've had that happen. I had a client that they, uh, it's a little different than this one, but they were doing a TV episode and, and we didn't load test where we test stress test the server. And they went down and I had to deal with those consequences of, you know, they're like, well, we've calculated what we lost. How are you gonna handle that? So this is actually good for you too, because you can help reduce your risk and liability around that because you can kind of prevent this. At least you have something to back up. We did some amount of testing. 
Um, but before we go into the actual examples of how this relates to WordPress, we'll talk a little bit about the types of testing um, that you can do. Um, and there's really three main types. There's unit tests, integration tests, and end-to-end -end tests. Um, so typically, depends, but typically the unit tests and the integration tests are going to be done by the developers that are developing your software. Not always the case, but majority of the time. Uh, the reason being is they need to basically go through and they can test certain things as they're writing functions and code and make sure it's getting the correct output that they expect. So for example, with unit tests, these are usually very quick tests that they do when they write, uh, let's say, a plugin or something, a specific function. You're just literally checking to see, is this you know, giving me exactly the value I expected? It? It's really good for bug testing. But typically, this isn't really going to look at the whole picture. Um, it's really just like, we're not going to release something that breaks a very specific function. Um, and then they may go a step further and do integration testing. And depending on the semantics of WordPress versus not WordPress, because WordPress is kind of different with how they do some testing, um, they may be testing it against core. They may be testing against core WordPress plus other plugins in their ecosystem. Um, so they're doing some amount of integration with other software, essentially, uh, to make sure it doesn't break. Um, again, core is kind of a good example. They want to make sure it works in core WordPress. Let's say they build a plugin, right? They've done all their unit testing, but they need to test through all of that. Um, but that kind of leaves the last one, which is end-to-end -end testing, which is typically the hardest to do. Uh, it's the most expensive to do, but this is almost always the one that falls on the website owner or the agency or whoever's actually working on the website um, after all those plugins get installed. Um, and that's where you essentially test through the entire process. Um, so you're going to go through and you're going to take like a user story or user experience and say, hey, this is exactly what happens from the beginning to the end, hence end-to-end -end testing. Right? Um, and again, there's no way that you can really rely on, let's say, commercial developers, or if you pay someone to custom build a plugin, that they can plan for your entire experience unless they have access to all of that. Um, and I think this is a point that often is lost in the community, just because you know, developers do an awesome job at this, the first two specifically. And that's why you know, the software's gotten better over the years. The plugins are you know, high quality, and you don't see as many things breaking. Um, but with that being said, the reason that end-to-end -end testing is important to do is, I mean, we're all running updates all the time, right? With 300 vulnerabilities typically a month, you then have the whole, well, do I run the update and hope it doesn't break, or do I have this potential security risk on my website, right? And it's not an easy you know, answer, but at the end of the day, a tool like end-to-end -end testing can at least give you some confidence uh, compared to essentially just hoping that you know, the, the developers are doing the best they can to test it. And this is just to illustrate essentially that typically end-to-end -end testing is going to be the smallest amount of tests ran it's at the top. Um, for that reason, that's not always true. Um, but again, with something like WordPress, in my opinion, we probably should be doing more end-to-end -end testing because we use so much additional code, especially, again, if you're using it in commercial code, um, because there's only so much they can test. Now, outside of the lost revenue I kind of already mentioned in your, your reputation, um, as I mentioned, it will allow you to you know, be able to run updates faster. So you can actually set up tests, and I'll show you. You can set up tests. like You could be running them in staging and going through the process of checking your user experience, making sure it works before you push it live. Um, you can even do things like, hey, when I push it live, automatically run a test. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. So it does give you some confidence. Um, now, with that being said, uh, keep in mind that it's reducing your risk. It's not a perfect solution. It doesn't mean it's always going to catch every situ situation. You're just trying to kind of pick up typically the baseline 
you know, examples of, you know, whatever your business critical functions really are. You can have like more like a very basic smoke test, which is where you're just, hey, does it look like there's an issue? And it's a very basic test, but you can make a more complicated one. It just takes longer. Uh, and then it can have benefits for even developers building plugins because typically when you're building plugins, you have to build specific uh, tests uh, for or test classes to actually test your code. Uh, and you can use um, end in testing in that process, and that just gives you a little more confidence to test new functionality out uh, and just see overall if it's working. Pretty obvious, but it, it basically benefits everyone to use this. Um, for example, developers I talked about, but a couple other ones are content managers and stakeholders, uh, because from the perspective, it, it often falls on them that they need to make sure the site's doing what it's supposed to be doing, right? Um, the developer is busy coding. They don't have time to be making sure the website's doing what it's supposed to be doing. So it ends up being that customers complain. Uh, and then they basically are like the ones that get blamed for that, uh, saying, hey, you know, why didn't you catch this? So this is a way, even as a content manager, or like I said, a manager of a website or stakeholder, you could do some basic tests like this. Obviously, end users, it's huge too because their user experience is going to get better and they're less likely to have bugs. So you might be like, okay, so you keep talking about end-to-end -end tests, but what is this really? <laughs> what is an end-to-end -end test? So all that really means is that you're going through the user experience, whatever story you want to define that as, um, that your application should be doing. Um, and typically, um, you're going to use some sort of browser to do that. So technically, I could do an end-to-end -end test where I just fire up my browser locally and I go to my website and I type everything in and I make sure it, it works. And you could set up like an assumption where you know, if I get the thank you message on my contact form, that's where I decide that it's validated. Or you might take it a step further and be like, I want it to say it's successful once I get the email as an admin or the, you know, the customer gets their, their confirmation email, right? So you kind of have to write up what that story is going to be. Um, but essentially, then you're just going through with the browser to do that. And we're going to talk about how you can essentially write tests to do that. And then later, you can actually just automate them so they run all the time. And it's spinning up a browser for you. Uh, so this is a really simple example. I'm going to our agency site. I'm going to the contact form at the top. I'm entering in some sample dummy data, essentially. I'm submitting that contact form, and I'm just validating the text value here. Most of you have probably done a very basic end-to-end -end test yourself at least once, not knowing what it was. Um, but the goal here is that we're going to try to standardize it and make it actually part of our routine. So as far as end-to-end -end frameworks go, um, there's a lot of them out there as we start to look into, again, building these tests and writing software that does this. Um, so you can first kind of start with what requirements you need. So do you want to test you know, with Chrome or Firefox, et cetera? Uh, most of them will support different browser engines. Not all of them do. The argument being that you're not doing browser compatibility testing here. You're just really doing a full end-to-end -end test. So you might decide the majority of our clients use Chrome. That's what we're going to focus on. Again, all of this, the goal is to do a practical application for end-to-end -end test. If you're running you know, a $1 billion company, you may have a much more robust solution. But the goal here is, again, to give you guys something that you can actually use. Um, a lot of them do use different code stacks. All I'm saying there is there's um, different basically frameworks that provide all the tools that you need to write tests. They can, for example, take visual screenshots. They can do visual regression testing. They can validate that it's running, all these sort of things. Um, and they will also let you decide like what browser engine and plug into that browser to do it. So you can do it locally on your computer. You can also use like a cloud-based system where they fire up the browser for you. Um, and with those, most of the time, the code's going to be in something specific like a JavaScript framework, for example, or a Java framework. I know that sounds weird. If anyone knows Java, it's kind of strange. But Selenium is a good example. Um, 
but most of the more modern ones will then let you write the test in whatever code you want. So you could write it in PHP, you could write it in you know, JavaScript, you could write on Python, really whatever you want. You're just writing out steps. And the way, so everyone understands, I'll show it in a minute, is if you're familiar with CSS and ID you know, selectors, that's all it's really typically doing is you're saying go to this page in this you know, input value with an ID of name, type in this value. That's all it's doing is really selecting those, and that's how it does it. Um, and it can be more complicated, but that's how majority of it works. And you can set up things like conditions, like if this happens, test this, so you can create a little more extensive logic. You can set delays, like wait for you know, this pop-up to load or to go away before you actually test my contact form, for an example. Um, and you can um, set up baselines and assumptions uh, for example, uh, again, you could say if either this happens or this is validated, you know, this essentially is either a successful test or move on to the next step. Most of them, the modern ones can take screenshots, even record that video for you. Uh, a lot of them will record your console. So if you're familiar with the browser console, it will record like any JavaScript errors that you have, any network uh, data that's being passed. Because a lot of times if you find an issue, that's how you maybe are going to have to fix it. You're gonna Either fix it yourself or send it to your developer and be like, hey, you know, the end-to-end -end test is getting this error. Can you figure out what's going on here? And you'll, you'll hand the, that to them, essentially. Um, and then you can do automated testing. Uh, that's essentially just where you schedule these tests to run automatically on their own, um, which we'll talk about. And then some of them can also do API testing uh, with even mocks, where you essentially get data back from like a fake API. Uh, to get the data you need to run through the rest of the test. Uh, there are some limits to what these can do, though. So, for example, um, it's really hard for them to test anti-bot and spam protection because essentially, if you're not running it yourself, you're using a bot, whether you know it or not, right? And we have all this software to prevent bots from running. Um, for example, if you use reCAPTCHA, uh, there are ways it can get around reCAPTCHA. Um, one, like for Google reCAPTCHA version 3, you can tweak it where you can start to get a high enough score that it may not trigger it all the time. Um, but it's just not very reliable, um, at least for most people. Uh, you can also just bypass. You know, you could set it up in your software where if it comes from this server, this IP, just bypass this and allow it through, stuff like that. So you kind of have to decide based on your situation. Um, but that is one of the harder ones. Another example is um, payments. If you're doing like a checkout, it's really hard to test payments with a bot. Um, technically, you could do it before, but it's getting really hard because if I set up a bunch of automated tests, my credit card processor is going to realize what I'm doing if it sees a pattern because it costs them money. Uh, and so doing real payments is a little harder, but you might use like a sandbox to do that, like a sandbox payment. If you've ever used the Stripe payment gateway and put in test mode, stuff like that, you could do during end-to-end -end tests. That's an easy way. A Couple other things that become a concern when you're doing this is it obviously creates data on your website, especially if you're doing it on a live site, it may submit a contact form, which may affect your conversions, and it may you know, send it to your customer or to you when you don't intend it to. So you have to kind of consider those things. And then, of course, if you're hooking it into like a CRM, it may send it off there. So there are some things you have to think practically what's the best way to do that. And then if you are working and you're using a browser-based setup with this, it's going to typically cost money because when you fire up a browser, that requires a computer, which means it's running all the time and you're paying for that. So it's like a whole nother server you basically have to pay for. Um, and then because it's a headless browser typically, which means it's just the browser without the UI. So for example, you might be using Chrome. A lot of them, you can't set up like extensions. So if there is an issue with like an ad blocker or there's an, you know, an issue with an antivirus, like you know, I've had a good example where it took us forever to figure out an antivirus was breaking PayPal. Um, and you know, it wouldn't pick up on that. So there are some limitations there. Okay, so you might say, well, there's a lot that, uh, you know, sounds nice about this, but this seems like a lot of work, right? A lot of money, a lot of time. 
So we're going to try to go over some practical examples today um, of how you can use no code testing to do some of these. Um, no code testing, you may be like, I hate no code. It's very limited. I've looked at it in other applications. It's not great. So, yep. Thank you. No, that's legit. I think actually when I created it, see, it doesn't look like this on that, but that's good to know. Thank you. Um, yeah, Michael, can you get the light? So with no code testing, um, essentially, um, these are just some examples of ones out there. But it really has opened up. Is that a little better, hopefully? OK. And really, these names don't matter that much. I mean, you can write them down. These are just, if you just look up low code testing, these are some examples. It's a pretty big um, industry now. But essentially, if you're a QA engineer, you're probably, if that's a professional job, you probably hate these tools because they have limitations like all no code software. You're not writing, it can't do as much logic, you don't have access to the actual code. They're more just going to let you click through and you can say what steps you want to run. Um, but for a very basic end-to-end -end test, they're actually really neat. Um, so for example, the first one on the list, Ghost Inspector, we're going to talk about and watch a quick video of how it works. Um, but some of these other ones do give you access to the code. They just tend to be much more expensive. Um, so with no code, uh, there's some primary advantages. Obviously, if you don't have a technical background uh, or you're, you, know, you have other things essentially to work on, it will allow you to write end-to-end -end tests without being a developer, essentially, or a QA engineer. Um, even if you are one, you can quickly duplicate and set up fairly intense tasks without writing as much code. And again, some people would argue they could write code faster, and that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with using straight up Cypress or you know, an end-to-end -end framework like that, Playwright, to actually do that. Um, but most of the, these no-code uh, platforms do actually use um, Selenium or Cypress um, or Playwright. They are using end-to-end -end testing frameworks. They're just putting it in a cloud, essentially, for you with a nice GUI. So you can, they'll write all the tests and everything in the background for you. Um, so overall, it can save a lot of time. Again, they'll do visual regression testing. So as another way to validate that you know, things aren't breaking on the site. Uh, and the other key thing, which I'll talk about right at the end, is that uh, machine learning and AI has made these tools a lot better than they used to be. So they're not as fragile, because most people that you know, are very professional engineers will tell you that you know, they're going to go down this step, this path, right? And if like your CSS selector changes, your ID changes, it's just going to break the test because you're constantly making changes. Maybe, you know, someone updates an ID on the contact form and then it just breaks. And you know it didn't really break the form. It shouldn't have, but it does. So some of the newer tools actually can see the intent of the test and they may note that, hey, this changed, but they're going to run it through and realize that, oh, this was the purpose of the test, not the ID. Um, I already kind of talked about the frag fragility of it, um, but if you're r setting up really complex sites with very complicated um, you know, functionality, it doesn't always make sense to use no code tools. Um, just because, again, I gave that example, if you're hooking to third party APIs and you actually want to test those, most of these tools aren't going to let you create like mock API data. Um, where you're getting back data like that. They're just not meant for that. They have a little more limited access. Um, again, you can't write the same amount of logic. It's very procedural. You're really just writing out steps for the most part. Some of them have some cool things, though. Uh, another thing is if you don't actually know about how your website works at all, it's kind of hard to write a test. You could do it with a basic contact form, but you do need to have some you know, idea of how your plugins are configured and you know, what sort of issues could crop up because you have to kind of keep that in mind as you're writing the tests. Um, a lot of these are cloud-based, which means they're going to be vendor lock-in is a real concern because if you're using something, again, I'd recommend Cypress or Playwright probably if you're going to write your own tests from scratch um, or you're going to spin up a server to yourself to do it, you can actually often move those tests between different frameworks. A lot of times they even use like a wrapper
uh, but they're using the same base uh, framework. Um, but with these tools, you're kind of locked in, essentially. You'd have to rebuild those tests. Um, I already mentioned the code access. And then if you have a very custom dev op environment, it's sometimes not going to be able, you're not, you're not going to be able to get the access because it's not on your server. All right, so I've blabbed on about a bunch of stuff. So let's try to talk about how can I actually use this in WordPress, right? Because that's why we're here, and that's what we're going to get into. Um, so I'm going to go over three different uh, platforms today where they're often used for WordPress. The first one's going to be more of a general platform, not WordPress specific, and the other two are actually built for WordPress sites only to do end-to-end -end testing. So if you haven't gotten anything out of it, this is probably the time you know, to wake up for a minute. <laughs> Um, so the first one is Ghost Inspector. Has anyone ever heard of Ghost Inspector? No? Well, okay, cool. So um, Ghost Inspector is a cloud-based, you know, you pay them basically monthly. They spin up, they use something called Selenium. That's their framework. They spin this up for you, essentially. They host it. They're the ones loading those browsers up. And they let you essentially go through and record steps um, and this one's one of the easier ones to use, and it's um, not super expensive, it's not super cheap, but um, this one's often used a lot in Ghost Inspector. So I just made a little quick video here um, to show you guys. So I've got a contact form here. So right up there, you might have seen before I clicked it, there's a little, where my arrow is, there's a, uh, a Chrome extension that I've installed where I'm literally just saying record, and it's recording, and now at this point, I'm essentially just um, going to reload the page so it knows that's a step. I'm just typing it in as if I was you know, a normal user, and it's actually recording it from the Chrome extension for me. So I don't have to write any tests, if that makes sense. So all I did was install the browser extension, hit record, and it's creating a new test that's gonna go to their system where it will generate the test for me, which I'll show you, I submit it, and I get a thank you message, essentially, right? And I basically finish that test, I give it a name, and you can create suites where you combine multiple tests if they're related. That's not a ghost inspector specific thing, that's just how end-to-end -end testing might work. You may wanna set one up for like checkout versus adding to a cart, or you might wanna combine them, it just kinda depends on how you set up your tests. And then the, now I'm actually in ghost inspector here, and I can see I've got my contact form, and there's just basically a test set up. And then right here, if I can stop this for you guys. Oh, give me one second. Because I think this is at least important to show y'all. No. Sorry guys. Videos are always dicey. There we go. So right here, I don't know if you can read that, but these are just different steps. And mostly, this is a ninja form, so it's just doing like nf-field-1. That's just the ID ninja forms creates by default with their plugin, essentially. And it's saying assign a value of test name. All that really is is the name field. So it's just writing those steps essentially for me using the IDs. And it's typically gonna use IDs because it's less likely to break than if you're using a class that might you know, break more often or may not be unique. So it's just going to the site and it's basically just filling the stuff out. And you can add conditions, you can copy steps, all that sort of stuff. So you can see it's, it's a really simple you know, GUI. If you just wanna set up a test on a site that you think is really critical to be running tests on, this is like a really easy tool that you could set up like today, uh, you know, and it, it really doesn't take too much work, little learning curve, but like you can see, it's not too bad. And then um, I think I just kind of clicked through and now I'm running that test. So I'm manually running the test because I haven't actually scheduled as an automated test. So it's actually run, run through now. And you can see it's just checking off saying, I did all these steps, none of them are red. So it's basically working, right? And it's making a video. It's got a little video you can watch. It shows it's passed. And this is a really simple example. So that's actually a remote browser, essentially, that's filling out that test. And you'll notice it's doing it really, really fast compared to how quickly we would do it. 
but because it requires, again, extra servers, they want to run that thing as fast as possible. And it's headless, which means it's not loading all the stuff Chrome normally loads. Um, so with that, you can, you, know, you can help slow down, or you can speed up the tests a little bit. And then it takes a valid validation. So there's a little contact right here. So it's actually screenshotting the last step. So if that failed, it does a visual regression test, or if it's just different, and it will fail the test automatically. So they usually do it on the last step. And then one important thing on this test that I didn't do, and it's even telling me, is you haven't set up an assertion step. And what that basically means is you're not really validating anything, you're just going through the contact form. But for all I know, I could submit it and then it throws an error because technically it filled out all the steps, right? So you can actually add in essentially a validation to say, hey, if I get like specific text, then go ahead and say this pass. Maybe it's my thank you message, right? Instead of an error message or something like that. So I'm basically copying over, you can, or you can see that's the thank you message I really want to see. And I'm obviously meandering around trying to get to the steps. So now I'm actually editing that test that it generated for me. And I can basically say, I want to do a validation. Well, first I'm going to pause it because I want to give it enough time just in case the network takes a second to pick that up. So I put three seconds on it. And then I'm going to say, is this basically element equal to? And so in this case, um, I'm actually going to use a CSS. You could also use XPath if you're familiar with that. Uh, I'm just using the NF response message from Ninja Forms to essentially go ahead and put in that value. And now it's running it again. And you might say, well, I don't understand CSS. I don't know how to do that. You could just rerun the test. It will actually let you add more steps using the Chrome extension. I was just showing you guys an example of how you can edit it and add your own CSS selector. And it will basically find that element and validate it. And there's a lot of other things you can do. Like I said, you can schedule tests. You can run them daily, weekly. And I would just do that based on how important this is, because you do pay, typically, per test. So you know, if you're, you know, if you're running something that's really important, you might want to run it every hour or you know, every day. You can also set where the tests are ran, which is pretty neat. You can even put in your own sample data. So let's say you're, you're not going to reset up, which I'll show you in a minute. You don't want to deal with having the form not go to your clients. You're just going to tell them I'm running these tests. Just put a filter on your email. But you could go ahead and give this system custom data, essentially, so when it fills it out, they know what that is, instead of just generic. Um, and they can make it dynamic, even, like test da da da. So it knows which test basically fails based on the submission in, let's say, Ninja Forms or Gravity or whatever you're using. So I'm going to skip forward a little bit here just to show you guys. So that actually right there is where I say, that if the NF response message equals thank you for contacting us, we will be in touch shortly. If that's valid, then cool. That means that validation worked. I'm not going to spend a ton of time for sake of time, but I did add some extra steps here. And this is just so you guys are aware, where you can actually create a temporary inbox in Ghost Inspector in their system. And again, this probably only took me 15 minutes, no code. I just had to follow some documentation. And essentially, it will generate an inbox. So when it gets filled out, it will go to them instead of us. And then essentially, they will actually use their browser, log into their inbox, and validate that the data is correct. Now, the only thing you have to keep in mind is because this was not actually meant for WordPress specifically. And I don't think I put the example just for sake of time. Well, actually, I did. So I'm filling all this out. It's just generating a, an ID. But this is a Ninja Forms. So what I had to do, though, is I had to say that do, don't send this email confirmation, essentially, if it includes Ghost Inspector in the email. So it's not going to go to my customers. Um, you could do the same thing with the submission. I don't want to save it in our database. 
So you do have to use some sort of conditional logic like on whatever plugin you're using if you don't want that to happen. And you might argue, well, then it's not a real test. But again, this is about practicality. You know, you, you have to limit how far you go with things. But that's one of the only real limitations from Ghost Inspector's side is it wasn't built for WordPress, which means you do have to write some extra logic if you don't want it mucking up the data. And you would have to do the same thing if it's triggering a CRM integration or something. You'd have to write that logic that says, if it's a Ghost Inspector email, is that value? Don't send it to you know, Zapier, or CRM, whatever you're, you're using. All right, so that's Ghost Inspector. How are we doing on time, Michael? How much? OK, cool. So I'm going to quickly go through this one. Uh, Shop Warden is a WordPress specific um, SaaS and a plugin. So it's different than Ghost Inspector because it actually talks to your WordPress plugin. Specifically, what they focus on is WooCommerce when you want to test checkout. Um, so what's nice about using this compared to something like um, Ghost Inspector is that you can actually connect it. And as, assuming you have just a basic WooCommerce site, you haven't basically uh, created a custom checkout with your own CSS selectors. You can just turn it on, and it will just start working. It's also going to delete the data automatically from after it validates it in your WooCommerce order tables. It's going to delete that data automatically. Uh, it's not going to send the order confirmation to your, you know, whoever your admin set to. It's basically doing all the things that you'd have to do manually in Ghost Inspector. It's just doing it in the plugin because they have a plugin on your website to do all of that. Um, and they do some other stuff too. Um, but that's essentially the biggest benefit of that is you can just set it up. And you might say, well, you know, we did create a custom page uh, for checkout or what have you. So at that point, you can actually still customize that just like in Ghost Inspector. You can tell it, we use these CSS selectors for first name, last name, you know, whatever fields you have. Um, and with their example, this is just like setting up a really simple site. I put in my e-commerce uh, website here. It basically, I install the plugin. It's going to go ahead and uh, get that set up. And I can just set up a new check, as they call it. You can do like a full checkout. Uh, so it will actually actually run through that. Or you can decide what you want to do. You can manually record, kind of like Ghost Inspector as well. Um, but in this case, I'm picking a full checkout. And for time, I'm just kind of showing it off. But I can pick what products I want to test. So you might want to pick you know, a very a configurable product, if that's a product you're always worried about. You might use multiple products. Um, it will crawl through the site. And similar to Ghost Inspector, you can tell it what data it's going to use at checkout um, for first name, last name, shipping address, that sort of stuff. So, if you even had different shipping options, you might want to set up a different test for each of them because that's something that often can break, right? Shipping, you may want to test a variety of, you know, wherever you're shipping to, that sort of thing. So now it's basically running through, getting it ready. And you can see this looks very familiar to Ghost Inspector, right? Um, it's just running through these tests, essentially, all the steps that are involved. And it does, this one's a little fancy because it does have some nice things like they remove the cookie banners, they'll work around pop-ups because that's a common issue that you'd have to manually do in Ghost Inspector. You'd have to give it extra code to do that. And even then it can be tricky because you don't have access to the code like you would with a, um, a non-hosted solution essentially. So I'm just gonna show you guys. So now it's basically filling out that form it's just going through it. And one thing you'll notice is it says shop right at the top, right corner, it says shop warden payments um, because it's using its own sandbox payment gateway uh, because you can't use a real credit card easily, right? But they also support like Stripe sandbox. So, you know, you, you could again do any of this kind of yourself if you want it to. Um, but it is nice they've built all this in. They do testing, da 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 da. And then a little different, but I think it's good for you guys to know is if, unlike Ghost Inspector, this will actually let you record steps in a browser inside your browser. 
so they basically boot up a, web, a copy of your site, and then I'm filling it out here, and it's recording it instead. So some tools you'll find do that. Ghost Inspector is actually a little more old school. It uses a Chrome extension, because most tools have switched to this, because people don't want to install another extension, or they don't want their customer to have to install one. So here I'm just setting up an example of a contact form and showing I can still do the same thing I just did in Ghost Inspector in this tool. The downside is this wasn't meant for forms either, which means the data, I'm mean, gonna still have to write that conditional logic to keep it from getting deleted. All right, last one. This is uh, Form 365, Form Tester 365. This is basically the other equivalent for contact forms for WordPress. You install their plugin, which I've already installed. It automatically picks up that I have this gravity form ready and it, it tries to find the URL that it's on because again, there's a plugin now installed talking to their system. And one thing to note is this only works with gravity forms currently, um, but it will essentially go through and I can just turn that on and it will run the test itself. I don't have to set up the steps at all. And it supports multi-page uh, you know, forms. It supports uh, conditional logic out of the box, it just does that. Now, certain things it doesn't do, uh, for example, payment forms it doesn't do, user registration it doesn't do. It can do like a, uh, a um, it can do a pretty complicated form with a lot of different field variables, and that's where you might test it, you might check with them, and this is one of those limitations of using a no code, is it may not work in every situation. Um, that's where you'd have to use uh, another test to do it, and they have this setup where you can basically run it every day, uh, and, it, and their, their platform doesn't do the same visual regression testing, although it does make a screenshot. So I know I had to kind of breeze through that, but this, cool. Um, but that kind of has a little bit of how you can do that. You can set up end-to-end -end testing uh, without having to write code or really spend a ton of time and money just figuring out if this is worth your time. Uh, you can also put this in your maintenance services. So for example, that's an added value you could add. You could even hook it onto your SLA saying, you know, we have a critical thing. If your contact form, your checkout goes down, this is covered. Everything else is a tier two, right? And you're laying that out for them so they understand it. But the benefit is everyone uses this. The user experience is gonna get better. And I think WordPress's reputation will get better too. Um, not a lot of time for this AI. Just want to mention, they are setting up some cool tools now where, as I mentioned, if the IDs and stuff change, it will not break the tests. It can help you scan your site, some of the newer tools, and just say, hey, these are the things you should be testing based on all the millions of sites we've tested. You need to be testing all these forms, these specific things that break. Um, you can even write like a prompt of what you want to test, and it will write the, the script for you. So a bunch of cool stuff that they're doing. So I know I had to breeze through that. Questions? Or did I just overwhelm everyone? <laughs> or it was just boring? Oh, yeah, like, so a smoke test could technically be, it, it's kind of subjective because it can really be whatever you consider is like the basic test that needs to be done. Um, so for example, there's a, there's a website that does a smoke test of WordPress plugins to make sure it just works on core. That's technically a smoke test because they're just activating and does it trigger any errors. Um, so that's usually, it's gonna be something basic, but you could technically argue filling out a basic contact form is a smoke test. So it just depends how far you kind of go with it. There's a lot of semantics with it. So I don't know if that helps, but other questions? No? Cool. So some of these tools do, the um, three I show do not, but because there's some overlap there, um, some of them I think um, that I had in that original list of no code, they actually will do accessibility testing as well because they're already basically crawling the site like a bot. So it, it makes sense that they can do accessibility testing uh, they can even test things like I had in the, the um, example, they can like download, let's say generate a document, let's say you're creating a PDF with gravity forms, could actually validate that that download, let's say it's a warranty registration, is actually working properly.
So it's, they can do quite a bit. So ghost inspector, yes. Uh, most of the ones I put in that original list that was not very accessible, uh, that uh, they, most of them can do it because they're just on the outside really. Um, but um, the last two I showed are just WordPress specific and that's why they just work turnkey because they're actually connected to your website to do that. Um, and one thing I'll mention is that you can use, let's say you wanted to do a contact form, uh, you can use something like Zapier to find out when your plugins get updated and you could use something like Ghost Inspector to just, or Shopboard to trigger these tests every time you run updates and you wouldn't have to write any code to do that. So it's pretty neat. Any questions? Cool? All right, well I think that's it. Thanks guys.